Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Lovely. Thanks, Satya. Thanks, sorry. Satya, lovely. Can we get started? Hello. Lovely. Thank you all. I'm sorry we had a slight delay in starting this afternoon session. I thank you for being here and welcome you to this afternoon's CENCOM Connect webinar titled Persuasive Communication, a Manager's Calling. And if you can all look at the opening slide here, I have posted an image uh, of a book by Shibroto Bhakti called Cell, which he released about a year ago. And he talks about persuasiveness in selling and sales. And he talks about it as a three-legged stool, part art, part science, and part witchcraft. The art and science is something that we're going to talk about this afternoon. And what I really like all of you to do is to add your personal witchcraft to your next pers uh, persuasive message. It's very important. You have to bring your personality. You have to bring your charm. You have to bring your gravitas. You have to actually give something of yourself in order to be uh, really uh, persuasive. So, uh, having yeah, I just changed the slide. Having cited Shibroto, I want to make one point very clear, is that we are all persuasive people. As managers, we need to be persuasive. It's not just about sales and marketing or, you know, trying to get somebody to buy some product or, you know, it's not, it's not some snake oil salesman kind of thing. Persuasion is the way all of us can become more effective, more successful by actually getting people to do the things that we want them to do. So whether you're a techie or whether you're in manufacturing or whether uh, you know, you're a, a dose uh, salesman on a railway station, everybody needs to be persuasive. I think this is very, very important. Many years ago, when I first started out as a manager, persuasion was not a big thing. It was more about telling people rather than selling people, which meant that you know everybody got treated like they were in the military and they were given instructions and orders and they were supposed to go out and follow them blindly. Nowadays, it doesn't work that way. All of you are very well qualified and experienced and you have great ideas and visions and hopes. And you need to be, you want to be persuaded. You want to know why something must be done, not just how something must be done. And therefore, this whole concept of persuasion is undergoing a, a, a disruptive change in the way companies are actually managed and uh, actually uh, results are obtained. And, and therefore persuasion is something that we need to build into our operating systems. And, and, and that's a little bit to do with that witchcraft piece. You need to be think of yourself as a persuasive person, irrespective of what you do or what your function is, at home, at work, with your friends, on social media, wherever you might be, you have to be persuasive. Having said that, persuasion is about communication. All of you are 
very, very experienced and you know, very confident in, in the work that you do. But being persuasive is not about knowledge alone. And in fact, it's a small part of it. Persuasion is more about communication. It's about how you pitch your idea. It's about how you, what argument you give people. It's about the reasons, the benefits, the upsides that you really talk about. And therefore persuasion is in large part communication. And to look at one of the many definitions of persuasion is what you've got on your screen now. It says it's a process aimed at changing a person's or a group's attitude or behavior towards some event, idea, object, or towards some other person. And this is done through the medium of communication using written or spoken words to convey information, feelings, or reasoning. And obviously a, a combination of these. It's not just one of them, it's always a combination of them. And, and, there, and there, there's a very interesting piece in this, and uh, I, I want to just highlight this in my next slide. The keywords here are changing attitude or behavior. Persuasion must result in, in some action, in, in the way you look at the world, in, in, in the products that you buy, in the way you work with people, in, in the ideas that you accept to be true. And therefore, changing attitude or behavior, that is important. It's action-oriented. Agreeing with somebody is not enough. Agreement or acquiescence does not necessarily mean you are persuaded. And we'll look at this in the next slide, okay? And therefore, you have to communicate. And you have to communicate using a combination of not just verbal or vocal kinds of things. You have to also get feelings and other logic into this entire piece of communication to the messaging that you put across as part of a persuasive argument into a transaction that is intended to change behavior. So remember this, it must change, it must result in actions which actually change outcomes. People must do things differently or do new things. And, and that's important. That's the desired outcome. And it's not just about words or speaking, it's also about the emotion, the witchcraft that you bring into this whole piece in order to move them to action. Remember this very clearly. Most of us end up believing that we can convince people. Con con convincing somebody is very different from persuading them. But let's take a look at how Shivrata Bhakti actually differentiates these two terms. Both of them come from old Latin terms. Certainly to persuade, you have to convince, but to convince is not to persuade. Because to convince somebody is to, is to conquer them, is to beat them into submission, into saying, Are Baba, I agree with you. It's forceful. And there's this, there's this piece about, hey, you know, I convinced you, which means that I won and you lost. That's, it's an unequal relationship in some sense, okay? And, and, and the orientation there is telling people. It has this, from I'm higher than you and I have beaten you into submission. Whereas the word persuade comes from persuadere, which talks about taking a position of advocacy, which means don't see yourself and the other parties in this transaction as adversarial. You're both, get yourself onto the side of the other part, which says, hey, I'm here to help you. I'm the person who helps you have a better life. I'm the person who makes you more successful at work. I'm the person who, uh, can bring benefits to you. And therefore, the first thing that this kind of consultative or advocacy approach takes 
is to take the fear out of the other party into saying, now what's Bringy going to do? He's going to hit me on the head with some data or some information or some, you know, other piece of messaging. And, and, and it creates negative feelings, right? So it's by being an advocate, you are advising people. You're, you're trying, you're telling them that I do things in your best interest, not necessarily mine. That is the persuader's best interest. Sure. You will, if you're able to persuade the other person, then you have achieved your objective. And that's kind of implicit and that's, that's acceptable to the other party, which says, it's okay. If I'm benefiting, I don't mind if the other person benefits too. And, and that's a good win-win situation. And therefore, the term sell that Shubroto uses in his book is as a concept of persuading people. Now, on this slide, you would have seen two points that I haven't talked about. One says logos, and the other says ethos, logos, and pathos. Can anybody tell me what language this might be in? I've got French, Greek, Greece, great. What else? Anybody wants to try this one? Wow. Give it a shot. Guess like mad. Well, it's not Latin. That's 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 a good one, Vivek. It's not quite Latin, though persuadere and convince is are Latin. Certainly not English. <laughs> English is derived from Latin, by the way. If, if, if you're interested, absolutely. It certainly is Greek. Okay. And, and, and it goes back. Let's go back 2300 years when Greece was a collection of city states. Each city in Greece was self governed. And the most famous of the Greek cities was Athens. Athens was uh, uh, the real uh, place where the action was. And one of the most prominent and well-known philosophers, statements, thinkers in Athens was uh, none other than Aristotle. And Aristotle lived in the 4th century BC and contributed to a lot of the knowledge that we have today in many, many ways. But something that he's most remembered for is defining this concept called rhetoric. The word that you see on the top is rhetoric. Rhetoric at that time, you know, governance, business, everything was done through speech and oratory. People, some of them, they probably didn't even have paper at that point in time. So everything was done in spoken mode. And Aristotle really talked about what goes into persuasive messaging. What is this rhetoric that one can apply? Argument, speech. And we can apply it today to both written as well as spoken communication, right? And he, in his uh, theory, he said that rhetoric, a, a persuasive argument must have three components. Ethos, Logos, and Pathos. He added a fourth one a little later, and that's something that we can talk about uh, separately. And, and apart from Logos and Pathos, he also talked about Kairos. It doesn't seem to go. Okay. I'm going to try and send this to you again, but it just doesn't seem to be working here. Can you try it, Anushi? Kairos. I hope you can all hear me and that things are not, uh, uh, things are working well because I'm facing a little trouble here. Uh, something seems to be holding it up. Oh, it's going to Vijay. It's not going to all, right, everyone. Now I got it. 
Okay, great. Lovely. Thanks for that. So you probably got the word Kairos. Kairos, let's talk about each four of these ones. Ethos is about character and credibility. So the first thing that Aristotle, Aristotle said that the first thing that you need to do is to get the other person to trust you, to get the other person to let you in and start actually listening to you. Okay? So the first component is ethos, and it's about establishing trust and credibility. And in, when we talk about trust, uh, trust and credibility, we're talking about two things. One is they should have trust in you as a person. That's the first piece. Are you really my advocate? Are you on my side? Are you going to do things that are in my best interest? These are fears that the, uh, the person being persuaded has. And therefore, first they have to open up to you and they have to let you in. Once they're convinced that you're a good guy, then they will start listening to you. This is number one. Number two is you have to establish the credibility of the purpose, that is the product, service, idea, solution, or change in behavior that you want the other person to embrace. They must say that, hey, you know, this guy is going to help me get insurance, which is going to you know, be really good for me when I grow old. I need health insurance, I need family insurance, I need personal insurance. So insurance as a, as a thought, for instance, is, is a good thing, right? And so you should also believe that that's something that's good. However, if somebody is proposing that you, know, you become an alcoholic and trying to persuade you to have your first drink, then you will ask yourself, hey, this is a good thing or not? Is it in my best interest? Is it something that other people will, you know, appreciate in me and so on and so forth? So ethos is credibility. And once that person has let you into their psyche, into they've, they've lowered the barrier between them and you because you built the credibility of yourself and your purpose, you can then start to provide logos. Logos is about argument. It's about data. It's about evidence. It's about logic. It's about reasoning. That's, that's what most of us actually end up doing. When we are trying to convince somebody, you convince people with argument. You, you, you zap them with all kinds of data, right? My product is better than your product because his has 20, 24 units and mine has 3,700 units. So now the discussion is 3,700 better than 24 and so on and so forth. Now it becomes very, it becomes very discreet, it becomes very complicated and, and therefore you have to be able to do this well in order to actually move ahead. Otherwise, uh, the evidence and the argument and the reasoning that you provide will not be effective. So let's look at step three. Step three says, I built credibility and now the other person trusts me and is in favor of the proposition that I have and I have provided logos, I have provided logic and argument and evidence that seems to be acceptable. At that point, the person may be convinced that it's a good idea, but may still not take action. So let me give you an example. You may be aware that more than 40, 50% of Indians have some form of diabetes or the other. Right? Do you all agree with me? Diabetes is a problem. I can provide you data. I can provide you information, statistics, World Health Organization, UNICEF, blah, 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 all very credible sources and great data. And you ultimately say, okay, diabetes is a problem. What happens after that? So I convinced you, but ultimately, all decision making is irrational beyond a point.
why 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 do i why do i buy an apple cell phone boy look at that coral color right it had nothing to do why do people pay money for expensive products ask yourself this question and you know that apple xr is now one of the top selling uh, models in the last one month or so snob value absolutely snob value is is what well, what is snob value it's pathos it's emotion it's irrationality right <laughs> you can call me a slob by all means <laughs> but the fact of the matter is i i bought it because i love the color and i said wow you know think about it in your life many of the decisions other things being equal or reasonably equal what you're going to do is oh but by the way oh wow somebody else also has an x r love it love it absolutely good so now we have social needs right you you're an x r guy and i am an x r guy suddenly you if i tell you tomorrow you know buy an omega watch you're going to say yeah bring it to me to buy it and we you know we we are the same kinds of people that's pathos it's it's this underlying emotional connection that you get and we're going to talk about this in different forms and then finally we're going to look at the fourth point which is sometimes uh, not quite always there which is kairos kairos is about time so you may uh, establish credibility you may provide evidence you may you know tweak my uh, my emotional buttons but if you're doing it in the middle of this webinar i'm not going to be able to do anything right timing is key and and you will find that good negotiators have a very good sense of timing they know when to make that request they know when to put it in the application is very important would you agree with me right especially you know i i used to have this problem if i needed my father to buy me a motorcycle i would find that right time when i know that he'll be open to my actually doing it right or if i say i'm going off to do something i'm going to trek in the himalayas my wife I have to I have to I have to be careful about when i tell her this right if i do it while she is rushing off to work she's not likely to be able to listen to me are you do you agree with me absolutely right satya says right thing to be done with right intention but at the wrong time so there are four pieces ethos logos pathos credibility evidence and emotion now while this is 2400 years old there are people who have actually been worked looking at uh, aristotle from before and there's a modern extension of the aristotelian rhetoric and there's this uh, gentleman called j conger who wrote this article called the necessary art of persuasion and he took aristotle's theory and actually made this more modern so we can do away with ethos logos and pathos and he says credibility evidence and emotional connect but as you might see he added a fourth piece which says frame for common ground can anybody help me with what framing for common ground might mean let's take a guess frame for common ground what it be left create win win situations very good so that's that's certainly a, a interesting way to look at it normative acceptance says vivek both have common goals alignment very good empathy i think is uh, not quite that provide a base very good you you guys are just absolutely on the ball at the moment right uh the issue is very simple is that in most persuasive situations you're trying to you're trying to provide a 
a solution to some problem or concern or issue that the other person has. In most cases, uh, persuasion is about trying to understand some limitation or some pain, what I call the pain, and, and then try and address that pain through uh, some change in behavior, some activity, and so on and so forth. Now, in most cases, apart from timing, timing is certainly an issue, but the other thing is that we have to align both parties. If we talk about advocacy, we have to both agree that the pain is a real pain. That's number one. Number two, that we need to solve that pain. That's most important. We all agree that diabetes is an issue, but unless you accept the fact that I have to do something about it with the other person, you will not actually move forward. You will not write that check. The difference between being convinced about the fact that diabetes is a problem and actually writing a check to an NGO that works in uh, diabetes uh, mitigation is a big step. I, I remember I've had this situation. Sometimes we go to people and say, I've got the world's best can opener. And the other guy says, so what? Right? Do you use cans? Yes. Do you want my can opener? No. So there may be a problem. There may be a solution. But there needs to be acceptance of the fact that we, that we are agreeable to solving that problem. So that happens only when both parties agree that the problem is important, the solution is important. So the trick about it is, is not to pitch. This is a problem that we got. As persuaders, we, we, we go in with our, you know, with our fist clenched and we want to slam the other guy with some data or information. And that's not enough. Have you ever asked, do you want to solve the problem? Do you think it's an issue? Is there something in your life that you believe is worth solving? We don't do that. You know, the next time you're pitching an idea to your boss, try and figure out what keeps him or her awake at night. Right? That's important. And say, boss, you know, I've seen you struggling with this thing. I have a suggestion. And you're likely to get a more positive response because you now got him to agree that he has a problem and he wants to solve that problem. In many cases, people just don't even start to agree on it. Are, are we good with this piece? Have I been able to help you with this concept of establishing a need to solve the problem? Let me know what you think via chat. This is very important. Don't go and, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of startups and I say, tell me, what does your startup do? And the first question is, let me show you my app. I don't want to see your app, right? I want you to tell me how you might be able to change my life. And I first need you to tell me that, hey, you know, we agree that I want to be sold. Today, you get a lot of junk phone calls. And somebody from Jabalpur or, uh, you know, uh, Mao or some place calls you up and says, would you like to have insurance? That's the wrong way to do it. Sure, insurance is a problem and they have an insurance product that they want to sell you. But that's not the way it starts. The way it starts is to first gain acceptance saying, can I talk to you? Would you be interested in, you know, knowing something about how to make your life secure? What are your concerns? And, and when you start to get the other person to open up about their concern, then you establish common ground, which says, wow, you seem to have a bit of an issue there. Would you be open to my actually telling you how you can go about solving that problem? And then you've got common ground. That's, that's very important. But first, you have to convince them that you're the right person. And that's why established credibility comes first. In most cases, when I receive these junk phone calls, I don't even know who is calling. I don't know how they got my name or number. Absolutely. Very good. Very good, Satya. That's, that's, that's absolutely good. So first, I have to let the other person let me in and, 
and reduce the resistance, then I have to get them to agree that we want to talk about this problem and that there is some benefit for everybody by actually solving it. Then I start to talk about my product, why it's so good, how it's different from other people, and why uh, and how it will help you. That's the part. And then finally, when, when that, convin that conviction is established in the other person, then you make this thing which says, I can, you know, take a decision now. It's good for you. At the point of, you know, I'm sure that all of you, when you made some fairly big purchase at some point in time, just before you swiped your card or did hit the Paytm button or, you know, transfer the money, did you have some, some fear? Did you have some doing the right thing? Right? That's when the emotional connect comes in. What do you think? Right? You got to put 25,000 rupees down on a new television set. That last piece from conviction to action is the most difficult of them all. Am I right? And therefore, what are you looking for at that time? Sorry, Baba, figure mat karo. You'll be all right. Mehuna, I will help you. We have three year warranty. We'll give you free part replacement. We have 24 by 7. Uh, you know, on call. So anywhere in India, we can solve your problem. I will give you money back guarantee. These are the connects that we make at, at this point, right? Wonderful, wonderful. So that little emotional piece actually triggers the action and moves people from desire to action. So we create awareness, we create interest, we create desire, but action is a little distance away. It's a four step process, action, uh, at awareness, interest, desire, and action. Are we all good so far? So, we don't have to worry about Aristotle having lived 2,400 years ago. Modern persuasive communication and behavior is very much uh, the same as it was a long time ago. Great. Suman raised his hand. Okay. Lovely. Thanks, Suman. You have a question? Just put it on the chat. Lovely. In the meanwhile, I will move forward. We just talked about Jay Conga. Let's look at a little more detail, okay? Even Krishna had to establish ethos with Arjuna. It's not enough that he was able to give Arjuna Gyan. At some point, Arjuna said, how I should I believe you, Krishna? What gives you the right to say all these things? And then Krishna has to unveil himself to Arjuna and he establishes credibility, right? So you need to do this. You need to be able to build trust. You need to be able to connect with the other person by, by sharing yourself. That's the witchcraft part of it. How do you, you have to be friendly. You have to be useful, you know, approachable. You have to take out the concerns that the person may have. You should be knowledgeable about your work. You should know how your audience will actually work. And this establishment of credibility is very important. Can you give me some examples of how you might establish credibility in your workspace or in your home space? Anybody? Right? Let's say you're pitching your dad for something or you're pitching your spouse for something. How would you actually get this done? Absolutely. Being friendly, honest, natural, very good. Okay, so if you want to get married, then you have to establish ethos. How would you do that? Show them your qualifications. Show them your, your, your lineage, which says, this is my family. You know, there are so many ways. Let's, empathy alone doesn't work. Empathy is, don't get empathy into this. Empathy never sold anybody anything. Empathy just says, I can feel your pain. I can understand your problem. That's, it's important. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition at this point in time. Good referrals, very good. How about a demo? How about a customer reference? 
How about a celebrity endorsement? Amitabh Bachchan uses Colgate. Do you? Now you're, what you're doing is you're transferring the credibility of Amitabh Bachchan to yourself, right? To your product. Wow. Sure. Very good. Very good. Trying to cite examples that your father or husband would relate to. Very good. Uh, your brand, what about the company? If I say I, I work for Dell, that's ethos. Because we all have some idea of how great a company Dell is, how long they've been around, what kind of good products that they and service that they give. Very good. Give demo. Wonderful. Absolutely. Social media reviews. Be careful with social media, uh, social media reviews sometimes. They could be fake, right? So again, establishing credibility in social media is a very hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. Be careful. Because there are too many jokers out there just bullshitting, okay? Don't mind my language, but that's exactly what they're doing. It, it's the whole point. If you're wanting to be persuasive in, in, in social media, it's not enough to just have Twitter. You need a blog. You need to have references. You need to have endorsements by other people, right? Look at your LinkedIn uh, profile and see what kind of endorsements that you've got. That's building ethos. Wonderful. Right. Site customers. How do we... Oh, by the way, uneducated people are not stupid. I'm sorry. It, it has nothing to do with education. Trust, respect, credibility are very intrinsic things that human beings have, okay? It's got nothing to do. Your, a, a farmer out in Mandia district has a very good idea of whether you're trustworthy or not. Please don't believe your, your, your body language, your non-verbals, the way you you know, respect them or the way you talk to them, give people a lot of information about your credibility. Do not believe that uneducated people are not capable of good judgment. They are extremely, they are smarter than you have. Most uh, farmers that I've met are very good judges of character, much better than you or I. The city actually kills many of our skills in terms of things. So, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, Mahesh. I hope I didn't beat up on you too much. But don't don't start with an uh, uh, assumption that un unlettered people are not smart. They are smarter than you and I are. So don't mind my saying that. Okay. <laughs> they migrated to cities. Okay. Great. So establishing ethos is one step, right? The second is, let's talk a little bit about framing for common ground. I put a few points down here on this slide, which says credibility lets you in, but then you have to get agreement on sol solving the problem, on the need to solve the problem. And so this word framing, framing is drawing a picture or establishing a common concept space where people actually agree to want to solve the problem, acceptance of bringing the two parties onto the same page and saying, okay, now let's move forward together is a, is a very important part of it, right? You have to establish what's in it for them first. What's in it for you? Unless common ground says you get these benefits and I get these benefits, but their benefits are primary and uh, more important than yours. You have to convince them as to why you should solve this problem. If you don't lose weight now, you won't get married, right? You may think that it's okay to eat burgers every day, but it results in some other issues. Do you, do you accept that statement? Now, if you've agreed that, you know, there are some, some positives, there are some issues relating to actually Stopping to eat burgers, then you can start to then talk about your health food, uh, you know, recipes or your products and so forth. Are we all doing okay so far? <clears throat> Once we've got past establishing credibility and trying to get people to agree on the need for a solution, 
then you can start to talk about your product, service, idea, uh, concept, whatever it is that you want to do. And when you do this, you have to do this in a soft fashion. Hard selling doesn't work anymore. If you look at today's newspapers, cover on cover, new Xiaomi 24 megapixel camera. Who cares? You think the uh, uh, ordinary person understands the difference between a 24 meg megapixel camera and a 2000 megapixel camera? Probably not. And the fact is that if you look at an Apple spec, the megapixels don't add up anywhere, but the pictures come out better, right? Now, that's the whole issue. It's not enough to just present data. Most of us believe that if I give you a truckload of data, you're convinced and therefore will be, can be persuaded to buy. That's not true. You're just, you, you should not confuse people with data. You should not just slam them with statistics and data and so on and so forth. Meenak, she raised her hand right away. And uh, so, uh, right, so what do I do with the raised hand then? Okay. Uh, I don't know whether she has a question or not. <laughs> Too much of spice in the curry. Right. You, It's all chilies and and, and no uh, jaggery in it at all, right? So the question is that what we do is rather than present facts, features, and functions, what we have to do is to interpret these to a next level, which is data, uh, which is benefit, which says my, my mobile phone has 128 GB of storage, which means that you can record every single birthday of yours from now till the age 99 and still have some space left over. Every time you give somebody some fact, tell them how it's going to benefit them, what it means, what, what it's going to do for them, right? That's very, very important. So let's try a simple exercise. Are you ready for an exercise? Right. The exercise is a very standard, and you probably know about this one. The idea is that you have to sell me a pen. Okay? And here's the pen. 25 rupee pen. You can see it. It's like what they dish out in I am and in the offices and so on and so forth. Right? What argument will you give? to persuade somebody to buy your pen. Can you try and give me some of your suggestions on a chat? Okay, so, and so what happened? Is it, it is stylish, okay, your pen is stylish. Very good, great colors. Bright colors, brighten your day, very good. It's, wow, it's an emotion, wow. Could you explain that to me? Okay, savings, lovely. Right, how important is your pen? How many times do you use it? Smooth writing, very good, that's a feature. Soft grip, lovely. Rediscover, beautiful handwriting, <laughs> lovely. Okay, great. Now, I must ask you this question. Who are you selling this to? Right? I appreciate that. What would appeal to a student, for instance? It's a pen you will hold in your pocket. It's a magnet it will come to your rescue. Wow. What is, what keeps, so you need to think about, if a student has to buy a pen, what, what do they use this pen for? I mean, apart from writing, writing is, is trivial. But what are their concerns? Will it let me down in the middle of the exam? Will it be blotchy? Is it, will it last through the exam? If you remember, Camelin had an ad which said, our pens write uh, 10 kilometers. Right. Wonderful. 
Focus should be on customer's need rather than functionality of the pen. Very good. Durability, cost. Okay, let's change this thing now. Suppose we're selling it to a stores and purchase manager and they buy millions of these, okay? Like I am Bangalore buys these 25 rupee pen and it even got IMB written on it and you know, Renault standard 20 rupee pen, right? If you were selling this to a purchase manager, what would be your argument? Ask what 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 are the concerns of a purchase manager? Okay, advertise branding. Yes, we can customize it. Very good. Wonderful. This is very important. So the store uh, the stores and purchase manager says, you know, we want to use it for branding. People will get it when people come for EPs. Cheapest one for seminar. Do you believe that cheap is actually a selling point? If you know how much we charge our seminar attendees, cheap is not an issue at all. Sometimes, yes. For a student, cheap may be important. But if you're selling it to a purchase manager, what keeps a purchase manager awake at night? Think about what, what they need. Value for money. Hold on to that term value. We'll come back to it. Quality and time. What time? Can you tell me about time? Delivery. Brilliant. Brilliant. On time, on time delivery. Very, very important. It's all the more. How big a company you are? What is the size of order you can handle? Can you deliver 10,000 pens in 24 hours notice? You know, these are issues. Will you, do you have a GST number? Do you have the ability to meet my requirement? Will you be able to pass, you know, the audit uh, process that we have? The point I'm making is when you're trying to persuade somebody, the audience, you need to understand that audience, what their problems are, what their real problems are. Features and functions are not their, are not what are going to get them to buy it, okay? It's at some level perception of what their fears are and what their issues are. So, yep, servicing, very good. Lovely. Will you take back your return policy? Very good. This is really good. Okay, now that's a different angle. You know, when you talk about, you know, everybody talks about eco friendly. Is eco friendly a Logos item or a Pethos item? Think about it. If, if do, do people actually buy because it's an eco friendly product? It's, a, it's not a sufficiency condition, in my opinion. So there are two types of conditions. There are necessary conditions and there are sufficiency conditions, right? First, it has to work well. Then if it's eco-friendly, I'll buy it. But I don't buy it primarily because it's eco-friendly, right? Think about this. Okay, interesting. Meenakshi's question. Absolutely, Meenakshi. Don't be, you know, this is a... If you could convince everybody and be successful every time, you and I wouldn't be in the seminar. You'd be in the Bahamas or someplace, right? Enjoying your, your next million dollars. You're absolutely right. 90% of all pitches and persuasion will not work. But you have to do this, and you have to do this properly. And, and, and over a period of time, you will get enough success to actually uh, become a very well-known and influential person. Do not persuade with the intention of, then you're trying to hammer the other person, which is, I have to win this thing. Don't get into that, okay? Does that help me, Rakshi? You can't. What, let me tell you, the companies that you work for, how much market share do you have? 2%, 1%, 0%, Right? If everybody was persuasive all the time, then you'd have 100% market share, right? But that doesn't work. So you have to be realistic about it. Being persuasive is a way of life. It's not an activity, right? You persuade your children, you persuade your spouse, you persuade your co-workers, you persuade your superiors. You do this as, a, as, as, as part of yourself. That's very important to understand. If you're expecting to get results every time, a lot of startups come to me and say, you know, I made this elevator pitch, but he didn't give me a check. And I say, duh. You know, that means 
It doesn't work like that. The process of persuading a person is step by step and you move them up the chain from awareness, interest, desire, action. You, you move them from ethos, common ground, logos. It's, it's something that you do over a period of time, okay? It happens even in advertising. You can't just put one ad out and expect somebody to go and buy, you know, raise an inquiry for your product. The process of, uh, <clears throat> of actually making the sale requires multiple touch points. It requires multiple messaging. The person has to see the message multiple times. So it's a process that goes on. Oh wow! We are, I hope I hope you don't mind if we take a little more time. Uh, we are already at five to four, and and we've got some distance to go. Uh, let Let's finish this exercise and then take a look at what we can do with it. Okay. Now let me change the pen. This is a Mont Blanc Meisterstroke, last Amazon price twenty six thousand rupees can you what kind of argument can you come up with some argument that you might want to convince a student to buy this product write your first check very good status symbol excellent meenakshi give to your father i don't see anything about what kind of ink it uses. I don't get anything about whether it's customizable. I'm not hearing anything about whether the pen, the nib is made of tungsten or molybdenum or something like that. The whole thing moved, right? Now, if you're trying to convince people about high value items, more pathos is required, less logos, because the logos doesn't work, right? It's very important. The same 15 rupee pen does the same job, but you're still wanting this person to buy it. It cannot be on the basis that it writes well. Of course it writes well. It's the world's best pen. I mean, that's that's not the reason why they buy it, right? You have to you have to get into other social status. It now you move this person up Maslow's hierarchy, right? It's no longer roti kapra or mobile. It's now about self-actualization. It's about status. It's about, you know. Uh, sign you you use this to sign your first job contract you know students love this kind of stuff right right limited edition wow beautiful you have created scarcity be one in a hundred people to own this very good it differentiates you it makes you feel good it makes the other person feel and some people buy status symbols to make other people feel jealous it's it's a, it's a it's it's something that people do very good Lovely, you guys are absolutely on top of this, right? The trick always, whether you're selling a high value product or a low value product, is to think of the problems that the person faces and to actually talk about the benefits and how you solve that problem, right? So here's a, a cutter, it looks like a very ordinary cutter, and you can talk about uh, horned jaws and then interpret it, which says easily cut away right fits nicely comfortable ergo comfortable handle fits nicely allows you to be more productive does not give you uh, blisters on your hand right it's got safety locks it's got better design angle jaws always move people up if you want to be persuasive move them up the up the value chain benefits 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 so that they don't ask, so what? If I say it's made of tungsten molybdenum, they'll say, so what? Okay? And if they don't understand what tungsten molybdenum is, then they say, this guy's trying to con me, right? You lose the ethos, the credibility that you built up. Whereas you don't need to do that, right? Have you ever watched a salesman uh, selling a sari to a lady? He never talks about chiffon or georgette or mysore silk. He says, Madam, you look ravishing in this. Absolutely suits your skin color. You know, they really move this up to a benefits piece, right? Nobody buys it only because it's georgette or whatever, right? Nobody buys georgette anymore, right? Anyway, so easy to use, user friendly, right? So we're getting there and it says ethos, logos, pathos. You have to use the emotional connect 
to make your ask. You can see that on the last line there. If you want to get married, you can apply ethos to let start dating somebody. You can lo use logos to tell them or show them your paycheck and everything. But ultimately, you have to ask, marry me. Otherwise, it's a very expensive business, isn't it? <laughs> right? Dating is an expensive business. But you need to show passion. You need to show commitment. You have to say, um, and by the way, common ground says, are you willing to spend the rest of your life with me? Right? Think about how the, all these pieces kick into each other. Right? Wonderful. So connecting at, at, at Pathos, let me show you a couple of examples. Right? Do you know who this is? Anybody? Come on. You all know who she is. <laughs> right. Look at the pathos in this first. You're creating ethos through using Alia, right? She has all the characteristics, the logos, that young, outdoors, active, smiling, These all these things work. And then look at the hip pitch. Who, who, who's their target audience in this? Absolutely, girls, right? And what are they trying to do? They're trying to create a strong emotional connect between hero and girls, which says, you know, girls need to use hero because everybody needs to have fun. You're, it, it's building them up in terms of saying, hey, you're, wor you're worth it. You're, you deserve it, right? There was this company said, because you're worth it. Which one was that? It's, these are the, these are, this is the application of pathos, right? It's not about the histrionics that we change Shole, you know, where the bad guy says more while he's dying and takes 20 minutes. And we're not talking about, we're not talking about Bethos. Bethos is, is very extreme. L'Oreal, yeah, okay, wonderful. Right, so this is an application of pathos, right? Very interesting. Let's, let's uh, quickly look at a couple of other things. One is establishing value. Having moved from rhetoric, I just want to spend a couple of moments on value. Value is an intangible. That's why you buy the iPhone XR, because you see something in it that the other person doesn't. And different people see different kinds of value in different kinds of products, services, ideas. And therefore, one definition was that value goes beyond cost. And the only way to show value in this is, I, I have this little, I came across this equation which says value equals benefits minus cost, right? It, it transcends cost. You must make your benefits appear to be much more than the cost. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get forward in your persuasive piece. That's number one. And the value proposition is measured by to what extent the solution that you offer actually addresses the problem. And in order to do that, and when I talk to startups, I use something called the value proposition canvas. This is a pictorial way of actually trying to match, to build value by saying, we give you benefits and that benefit vastly uh, outstrips the, the cost that you might have. And so if you look at this, there's customer jobs, or let's say Big Basket. What's the customer job in Big Basket? We need to eat, right? And what do we need to do? Double, we are double income, no kids, work late, no time to. What are the problems that we face in going home and eating? Cooking food, right? And to cook food, we need groceries, we need condiments, we need desserts but no time to go to the store and buy it. So there's a big problem here. And what would we like to see as gains? It would be great if it could be delivered to me as and when I need it. I need to have cost-effective, fresh, home-delivered groceries. And that's what Big Basket does, right? So Big Basket gives you the pain relievers, which says we will deliver. We have different levels of delivery. That's Logos. We have Express, Tatkal, right now, monthly subscription, you know, uh, we, and you can do it on your mobile phone and you can, uh, you know, get all kinds of benefits. And we've got frequent flyer point. 
gain creators. What do we do? To what extent does Big Basket actually address this? And it creates coupons, value, savings, eat better, guarantees. Are we, are we all getting a fit on how to create a value proposition? And to the extent, the, the, the greater the fit, as you will see here between the, uh, the, the customer segment side and the offering, how much does your product actually, to what extent does it address the issues that the customer faces? So customers have to get things done. There are issues which come in the way of actually make, uh, doing those efficiently. And here are the expectations of the customer. Right, Swiggy is another option. So Big Basket and Swiggy actually compete, right, for, for wallet space. Absolutely. So this is about value, establishing value. The thing about being persuasive is that you must be able to tell people, boss, one, one lakh of rupees is a small price to pay for peace of mind. Okay. One last uh, couple of pieces here. There's another gentleman called Cialdini. He's the guru of modern influence and persuasion. And he gives us some very interesting tips in how to be more persuasive. The first he says is, don't ask, give. Establish reciprocity, which says, I will help you with this if you will do something for me. Always get into a negotiation mode. If you offer, people are more likely to respond in a positive manager. Create obligations, give to take. That's one very nice way of actually doing this, okay, to, of being persuasive. Don't try and hammer people, start a negotiation process. The second is create scarcity. Hurry, till stocks last. Offer open till 2400 hours today. Amazon does this beautifully. Only three left in stock. If you order in the next five and a half hour minutes, I will deliver it to you in 32 minutes from now. They create, they create uh, impetus to move people from interest to desire. Another way of making it scarce is somebody very nicely pointed out, which says, you will exclusivity, you will be one in a million people who own a mom blood. And then Sialdini talks about establishing authority. Are you seen as an expert? Do you build credibility? As part of the credibility building process, are you able to actually demonstrate authority and thereby give assurance to other people? Number four, consistency. Do not chop and change. Just because you feel that that person is not reacting well to your proposition, don't change stack and now say something completely different. And then the guy will say, hey, what's happening over here? Two minutes ago he said this, now he's saying this. I don't know whether I can trust this person. Consistency builds trust. The next thing Cialdini says is get people to like you. They are more likely to do business or be persuaded by you if they like you. So when you go in for a meeting, have a little starting protocol. <coughs> Chit chat, try to establish some common connections. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting a little enthusiastic over here. <coughs> try and get the other person to like you first. <coughs> oh, the word negotiation, by the way, Ramakant, I don't mean negotiation as in a price negotiation or a terms negotiation. It's a give and take. Give and take is also a negotiation. But you, what you're saying is, if, if you're willing to place an order in the next 24 hours, I will give you some extra benefit. If you're willing to give me 10%, uh, 10 minutes of your time, I will change your life. It's not a negotiation as in a hard terms and conditions kind of negotiation, right? 
Uh, and then uh, I'm trying to figure out uh, what Gopila had to say. Doesn't it contradict with expanding the pie in B2B negotiations? What does that mean? Not sure what that means actually. And 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 what? Which of these points are you trying to uh, take a look at? Are you referring to reciprocity or authority or scarcity? It would be useful if you tell me, then I can address that issue. Absolutely, sense of urgency. Right. <clears throat> oh, by the way, uh, I agree with you. B two B. Uh, persuasion is further long drawn out. You need to know when to be able to bring in the scarcity period. For instance, sometimes we, we bring in scarcity by actually saying that if you give me the order before March 31st, I will be able to extend a additional discount to you. We do it even in B2B negotiation. There are ways by which one can build a sense of urgency to place the order. Or you could say that if you place the order before February 1st, then you will not be affected by the budget changes that are likely to happen. Or the, uh, the rupee is weakening against the dollar. The sooner you make your import decision, the lower the price will be to you. Do some of these help? Last data put line for admission. Very good. Right. <clears throat> I, I should, I should, okay, I, I think I, I need to explain reciprocity. Reciprocal means a two-sided kind of piece. Maybe the word negotiation has thrown you off a little bit, right? But reciprocity means that interaction. It means sharing. It means your doing and my doing. It, 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 it helps in an advocacy kind of statement. Uh, if you're willing to give me 20 minutes, I'd like to make you a presentation. This is very important. Reciprocity builds commitment step by step. By instead of hitting the person and thinking and so buy my product, you say, if I if I if I give you a sample, would you be willing to try it? Hindustan Unilever does this very well. They give away samples and say, give me feedback. That's a method of reciprocity. Would you be, if you're willing to write me an endorsement, I will write you an endorsement. That's reciprocity. It's, it's, it is a form of negotiation, which says you agree to something and I'll agree to something. But the point I'm making here is that you should offer to do something first, rather than expect the other person to do it. The reciprocity should originate from you, rather than from asking them to demonstrate interest or uh, desire before you actually do it. Does that help a little bit? <clears throat> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you can commit a uh, two, two year contract, I will be able to look at my pricing all over again. Right. This is something that we can actually do. Right. <clears throat> I'm trying to. Uh, Meenakshi has a question here. She says, as a startup and a fresher, what advice can you give to negotiate well between B2B? You know, for early stage startups, we're trying to get what we call marquee customers. You're trying to get your first few customers. <clears throat> let, let me give an example, okay? I used to work for a startup and we were wanting to do some work with insurance agencies and they were just not letting us in. So at that time, what we did was we went to HDFC Standard Life and said, we're willing to run three cycles of our program free for you. What you need to do for us is to give, give us your time, you know, give us your people, tell us about your processes and we'll do it for free. However, if you're happy with it, then we'd like you to give us an endorsement. And then we, we did it, we did it for free, it worked out very well. HDFC Standard Life gave us a small order to start with, and they gave us a letter saying, we're very happy, and we took that letter to five other insurance companies and got orders from them. Because 
the credibility, the ethos brought by HDFC Standard Life in the insurance business was so high that an endorsement from their side actually do it. So <clears throat> this is part of the investment that a startup makes is, is to do some work to establish uh, the credibility of your business and your, your purpose. <clears throat> Right. On liking and creating rapport for unwilling parents for business or future wife for marriage. Wow. That's that, that marriage is uh, a whole different set of persuasion, right? Really quite, quite complex to answer that kind of question at this point. <clears throat> You know, so let me tell you my, if you don't mind, my personal experience. So when I decided to get married, my parents were opposed to it. I used a very hard technique on them. And I'm not suggesting that you do, but I'll tell you what I did. I said, I'm getting married anyway. The sooner you get used to the fact, the better. And then, then they realized that I was quite serious about what I was doing. And then we've had a happily married uh, life and very happy parents-in-law on both sides after that. Okay, quite see, or quite honestly, it's it's something that we can't do. <clears throat> you know that you need to do. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they don't like your fiance, but try and create more rapport. Do it slowly. Don't be in a rush, especially in B two B kinds of sales. There's enough time. You, you need to work consistently. That consistently, you would build one story with your prospective client. And the last piece, by the way, folks, I'm taking up a lot of your time. Uh, consensus is very important. Consensus is, is, is something that gives assurance to people. The word consistency as, you, consensus as used by a CID needs an explanation which says, you're not the only person, okay? There are many people like you. Here are our list of customers. Here are references. Here are testimonials, endorsements. All these things go to give assurance to the other person that what they're getting into is something that they're not the first people to do it. There are precedents. There are other people in this. If, if you buy a Harley Davidson, you will be joining a select group of 150,000 people across the world. I mean, they can't be wrong, can they? And they just love it. And you seem to be exactly the Harley Davidson kind of person that, uh, you know, uh, like they are. And, and therefore, don't worry about it. You'll do good. You know, that's, that's, what, that's how we give. <clears throat> uh, right. Lovely. Colleges, right? Many foreign universities have offers if you do more than one course or bring your friend. Right. All loyalty programs, all all sign of friends are all reciprocity kinds of issues, which says, do something for me and I'll do something for you. Absolutely. So that's what Cialdini says. If if, if you're interested, there's a lot of information uh, on the web. Cialdini has his own website. And it's called the Principles of Persuasion. Influence at Work is the website over there. You can go and take a look at that. <clears throat> if you are interested in some additional reading, you can access uh, The Necessary Art of Persuasion by Jay Conger, and that's the website. We will send you these slides, or just go and do a search on uh, Necessary and Jay Conger. It's, it's one of the most popular articles ever published by Harvard Business Publishing. And it'll give you a lot of tips. <clears throat> That's pretty much what I wanted to say. To quickly summarize, we talked about why every one of us needs to be persuasive, not just salespeople. We talked about the Aristotelian rhetoric. We looked at a modern extension that was created by Jay Conger. We went into a little detail about each one of these pieces. We tried to look at features and functions versus benefits and talked about actually use benefits to persuade and not data and raw numbers. And then we looked at what Cialdini had to say about being persuasive. Great. 
Ah, oh, wonderful. Satyat, really appreciate your comments. You've been supporting this uh, session very well. Uh, if you have any questions, I, I don't want to hold you. I'm available, but you are, I've taken just far too much of your time. And uh, so you know, I'm, I'm going to give you some reciprocity. You can always send me your questions. And, and Anushi, my colleague, and I will respond to you. What it needs is you need to do something, and we'll give you. Uh, that's the deal, OK? We're making a deal. You send me questions, I'll send you answers. Wow, so I established more than $10,000 of value at this point, right? Think about it. Be persuasive, guys. You're not going to win every time. There's no guarantee. There are far too many intangibles in a persuasive situation. But you need to work on it, and you'll get better at it. At some point, people will start calling you because they trust you, and they know you're an advocate of their best interest. That's influence, OK? Influences when people say, hey, come and help me. I have a problem. I hope you can all get to that. Uh, yes, there will be a recording of this entire session. We'll put up the slides. I'll be happy to take questions if you send them to, uh, to me or to CENCOM. And we'll certainly get back to you. Uh, it will go on the IMB website, and, there is, and that in turn will take you to YouTube. So the video will be available there. Thank you all very much. I'm sorry again that I took up so much of your time. <clears throat> OK, we've got Prashant's question. We'll get back to you offline. But I think we should uh, go now. Uh, I, I uh, really appreciate it. You're most welcome, Mahir. Oh, you saw me in 2006? <laughs> Haven't I gone whiter since then? Oh, wow. Thanks so much. I've been around here for a while now. Thank you, Prashant. OK, we're going to sign off now. All of you have a great weekend. And uh, I wish you all great persuasion. Don't worry. Keep trying. You'll get better. I hope I've been able to persuade you to be a better persuader. <clears throat> Absolutely, Namakant. Uh, you're most welcome. Can I go off the air now? Thanks, and bye-bye. <laughs> Stop share. How do I save it? But it became quite interactive, right? Yeah. We, and we had 40 people around, that's good, right? Did we lose a lot of them? No, we had 61, 64. They, until 4 5. Only after 4 5 people started. Yeah. Because that's when I told you. That's fine. Because they have to go do other things, right? Yeah. You can't be just hanging around listening to me also.